say right if okay. you agree that right, like the name right, is a okay. word. Well, we are now live on the Revolution 250 podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Allison, the chair of Rev250's advisory group. And Rev250, a consortium of groups in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the 250th anniversaries of American independence. And our guest today comes to us from South Carolina, Woody Holton. And Professor Holton is the Peter and Bonnie McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Woody. Thank you for having me. And your latest book is Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. So what's hidden about it? So much and so much that matters, too. My biggest focus is on groups, whole groups of people who were significant to the revolution but are, are tend to be mentioned in a chapter in the back saying, oh, yes, there were also Indians in those days, mm -hmm. uh, for example. But I would argue uh, to, to start to throw sort of throw down a challenge. I would say no Indians, no Stamp Act. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. People watching this podcast know the revolution, but people who don't know it, the one thing they know is taxation without representation. Right. Right. But what was that money going to from the Stamp Act? if not to pay for the 7,500 troops placed mostly along the western border as peacekeeping troops between the colonists and the Indians. The British government didn't want another expensive war like the French and Indian right. War. So they put, and my line, uh, Bob, which I, uh, which I was being a little silly in the book, what I said, oh, okay, the British are going to put a human wall on the western border of, its, of their colonies in America they're going to build this wall and they're going to make the colonists pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Talk. And this is actually something you talked about in your first book, Forced Founders, which received the Merle Curdy Social History Award, as well as the Francis Tavern Museum Book Award. And that book really looks at the way debt and the debt that was incurred by having to protect the frontier led Virginia into the revolution. So it's something you've been thinking about for quite a while. Yes. And it's been fun for me because I think the, the, the historiography has evolved. I've personally uh, evolved. When I first started looking into the issue of debt, I was struck with this amazing number that uh, Virginia alone uh, owed more than two million pounds sterling. Individual planters there, people you've heard of like Carters and Lees, mm -hmm. owed a lot of money. And uh, there had been a book published in 1926 by Isaac Carroll, one of the progressive historians, mm -hmm called loyalism in Virginia, but but this big throwdown argument there was that the British, that the Americans were just trying to get out of those debts. Right. And I, that was an attractive notion just because it was so subversive, but I ended up not buying that. I ended up saying that Virginians declared, uh, rebelled against Britain, not the Declaration of Independence, but they got to the point of boycotting Britain in order to pay their debts. Because right. A, if you're not buying stuff from Britain, you're not running up further debts, and B, by promising to withhold their tobacco, the number one crop from North America, mm -hmm. they drove up the price uh, and mm -hmm. that allowed them to pay off their debts quicker. So I think that's one comparison between the old progressive historians. Some people refer to my group, I don't love the term, but as the neo-progressives, but mm -hmm. the neo is important, you know, that we are different from the from the old the guys. Old ones. Yeah. In some yeah. Ways. Good. Good. So you talk in your new book, about it's a really a synthesis. Is it would you call it a synthesis of the revolution as a whole? Looking at through through this new lens, that's what it's lens? attempting to be. Yes, um, but uh, you know, synthesis among historians sort of has a a, a bad odor attached to mm -hmm. it because it implies just summarizing what's come before. Right, and I do plenty of that because mm -hmm. there's lots of areas here. Well, here's my new analogy, Bob. That historians are like cheerleaders doing their tripod where you mm -hmm. stand on the shoulders of the people who got there before you did, but in the process of standing on their shoulders, you sometimes kick them in the face. Um, right. and, 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 and we sometimes do it accidentally, and sometimes like them, but also sometimes in, on purpose because we, we are questioning uh, what they're saying. But so, yes, I, I'm both heavily relying on other historians, but also mm -hmm. questioning uh, uh, not only the things that ordinary people don't know about, like the one I just mentioned, the Indians role in the Stamp Act, but also think areas where I disagree uh, mm -hmm. with other historians. Right. So you've also, uh, so, so Indians, big piece of this, the frontier. What are some of the other hidden stories that you are, are telling in this book? 
Well, another group that I, whose influence I think is underrated is African Americans. Mm -hmm. It's worth remembering that one in five residents of the 13 colonies that rebelled were African American. And actually, we should remember, as you know, but not everybody does, that Britain had 26 colonies in America right. in 1776, only 13 of which rebelled. The bulk of the rest of the population was in the Caribbean, which of right. course was about 90 percent black and enslaved. But in North America, I see two ways in which African Americans really influenced things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a complicated thing because I, I, I want to talk about a stadial view of the American Revolution. By stadial, I mean it came in stages. So mm -hmm. Americans were mad about the white Americans were mad about taxes and mm -hmm. territory and, and uh, trade restrictions. We, we definitely want to talk about molasses before we're done, because that's a big thing in your part right, of, right. of North of early North America. But Americans were bad, mad about uh, these things. But all they were mad at was Parliament's rebellion. Right. It was really the Parliament that rebelled against the earlier relationship by levying taxes, restricting right. the colonist Western movement, by cracking down on molasses right. smugglers. So I, I, I there's a part of me that wished I'd called the first, I, I actually do call the first section of my book, the King's Grievances. Mm -hmm. and, and an even more descriptive term would have been Parliament's Rebellion. Right. Because it's Parliament that wants changes. The colonists, right. all they want to go back. To, you remember Barbara Streisand? The way we were. <laughs> they wanted to go back That's to right. how they've been in 1762. So here's where African Americans come into it. You get colonists protesting, things like the Boston Tea Party. You get mm -hmm. Parliament punishing the protesters, mm -hmm. for instance, by closing the port of Boston and the other coercive acts. And that then provides an opening for African Americans who see white loyalists over here mm -hmm. and white uh, patriots over here. And within that gap is an opportunity for them. Right. And uh, Abigail Adams, uh, your neighbor, uh, was yeah. one of the first to report this in September of 1774. She heard a rumor, could be wrong, but people act on what they think they see, not what really, well, not what's really out there. She heard a rumor that an African uh, enslaved Africans in Boston had got up a petition to General Gage, who was also Governor Gage, as you know, mm -hmm. in 1774, saying, look, you need, you're going to need soldiers against the Patriots who outnumber mm -hmm. yeah. you. Put us to work and give mm -hmm. us our freedom. Right. And she also heard that General Gates didn't just throw it in the fire, but uh, handed it off to one of his aides and said, check on this. Right. Yeah. That is taking it seriously. Yeah. Well, we know that African-Americans were petitioning. They had petitioned the general, the assembly saying, we expect great things from men who have made such a stand for the rights of man that is remember us. And then, so yeah, you can see that they are negotiating, figuring out where they stand or where they could stand in this. And where they really see an opportunity, you know, so those petitions up, up through 1773 were kind of desperate. I mean, they, they yeah. were just trying to appeal to people to be consistent, but no one's ever consistent. So that much hope there, but there, there was real hope starting in the fall of 74. Uh, James Madison saw it down in Virginia right. as well that uh, African-Americans there were starting to meet and plan how they could exploit this division. You always talk about the British Empire being good at divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. Well, black Americans were also good at divide and conquer right. because they could see this division between patriots and loyalists. As you know, in Rhode Island, African-Americans, uh, many of them got free by fighting on the patriot side. But mm -hmm. where I'm from, I was born in Virginia, live in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Many more got free by fighting on the British side and how this relates to, to the basic story of the revolution uh, is that white Americans were furious at the British for making, I, 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 I get some pushback on this, but I call it an informal alliance mm -hmm. between African Americans and the British. It's not like the British were abolitionists. They weren't making, yeah. they weren't freeing blacks out of the goodness of their hearts. Mm -hmm. They needed labor. Right. Uh, and, and so it's, but they did make this coalition. And of course, it shows up in the Declaration of Independence as this capstone grievance mm -hmm. that Jefferson and the rest of Congress has against Parliament and the king is he has excited domestic insurrection right. amongst us, meaning this alliance yeah. with the slaves. Right. Right. We're talking with Woody Holton, the McCausland professor of history at the University of South Carolina and the author of Liberty is Sweet, the Hidden History of the American Revolution. You know, 
so you know, the declaration also had that you know attack on the slave trade that they excise uh and did that did that conf was that just confusing the matter why what's the story there well, Jefferson's report is that there was a coalition that got rid of that denunciation of the slave trade from the from his original rough draft of the declaration, the coalition of deep South uh, delegates, that is South Carolina and Georgia. Florida, of course, was still part of Florida, uh, was still part of Spain, yeah. um, but deep South delegates who wanted to keep importing slaves. Virginia, where he lived, they had enough slaves and they were frankly, yeah. they were growing their own. He saw women as more valuable than men because men only produced wealth, whereas mm -hmm. women did that, but also reproduce it. Right. So there's a division within the South. And then the other part of that coalition that that excised to the reference to the slave trade from the declaration uh, were uh, Northerners who mm -hmm. were involved, didn't have a lot of slaves, only fewer than 5 yeah. percent in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. but they were the one they were making huge profits off the slave trade. Right. Right. So how does your book help us to think then about the meaning of liberty for these various folks in 1775, 1776, as we're, you know, struggling to figure out, you know, we're rebelling against Parliament, which had been rebelling against the way things were, we, which we kind of liked. And how do we, you know, what, what changes as a result of the revolution? Well, two, that's two separate questions. Let me ask the first yes. part first, which is the, uh, I'm really struck by me fighting for my liberty often puts me, see if I can reach across to your screen, mm -hmm. puts me into conflict with you fighting right. for your yeah. liberty. So you have uh, Jefferson's liberty, uh, which he was sincere about, that puts mm -hmm. him in contention with the 30 of his slaves who escaped uh, to mm -hmm. the British, some of whom we recovered, most of whom died, right. a few of them made it to freedom. And, and of course, that's also conflicting with the Native Americans and their idea of liberty to keep their lands and mm -hmm. with the British themselves because British taxpayers are saying, why should we pay for these troops on the western border of, of, the, of the British colonies in North America? We want to be free from the taxes we're paying to. Mm -hmm. so they felt like they were paying somebody else's bar bill, basically. Uh, and so one thing that I, I believe in liberty, liberty is in the title of my book. Right. Yeah. Uh, my, but it's such a complex concept because my struggling for liberty often puts me in conflict with other people right. who are looking for it. On the impact question, this is something I'm really excited about, and I, I, I'm going to use your podcast to announce a Twitter thread that I'm running between now and Veterans Day with the help of a of a super a superb student of mine. Uh, it's called uh, hashtag Lemuel Haynes Project. Okay. And Bob, you know Lemuel Haynes. Yes. Yes. He became the first black congregationalist minister and mm -hmm. big conservative federalist. Yeah. But you may also remember that in 1776, uh, this, um, you could call him free black, mixed race. His mom was white, dad was black. Mm -hmm. He was serving in the Continental Army and he got a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And he used it as the, epi uh, the, the famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, mm -hmm. all men are created equal. Endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, for life, liberty, and of happiness. He used that as the epigraph at the start of an anti slavery mm -hmm. essay that he wrote. And here's the significance of this because I love quizzing people on this because I certainly didn't know who was the first person to quote that iconic phrase from the De Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. And the answer is this black guy. Lemuel uh, Haynes. Lemuel Haynes, absolutely. And then here's what my student, and he was, uh, my student was following up something that Eric Slaughter, the literary scholar at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. had worked out, which is the declaration, that clause of the declaration gets quoted 27 more times before the year 1800. That is the rest of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. 27 quotes. Wow. Eight, eight of them were from people who were not abolitionists, and 19 of those mm -hmm. 27 quotes, 70%, came from abolitionists. And here's why that mattered. Until then, and I'm trying, I'm gonna try to pick a fight with you here, Bob, because we may disagree on this. Until all of those people quoted the equality clause and shifted the spotlight up to that paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Until then, the Declaration of Independence, as originally conceived by Congress, was a secession document. Yeah. I mean secession in the ugly way that we think right. of it, the Civil War, but simply saying these 13 parts of the British Empire have a right to break away from the other mm -hmm. and then form a new alliance with France. And right. members of Congress were saying in June 1776, 
if we can get this Declaration of Independence off to France quickly, we can have a French Navy in American waters by the end of seven, by the by the summer of 1776, the late late summer. In that respect, of as an overture to France for an alliance, the Declaration of Independence failed because, mm -hmm. as you know, it would be another two years right. before France finally made, came into a formal alliance and sent a navy to uh, to America. Mm -hmm. uh, it failed as it's as what Congress intended as an overture to France. Right. But people like Lemuel Haynes and all those other mm -hmm. abolitionists and later women's rights advocates turned it into right. the most famous freedom document ever yeah. written. That's right. But then on the other hand, a lot of the state constitutions have that language as part of their declaration of rights. You know, in Virginia, they edited it a bit, so we were not actually, but yeah, right. so... Yes, they, they, uh, the, the, uh, not that exact phrase, but absolutely true. Born free. Uh, what's the phrase yeah. in the Massachusetts Constitution? All men Born free and equal and of certain natural, essential and in Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, rights of which they cannot be divested. Yeah, it's so, so it is very similar to that. But that's I'm, interesting. It's Lemuel Haynes picking that up as the important thing. Um, I, I'm inclined to try to disagree with you just for the sake of being disagreeable, but I, I think it's plausible that this is, it, because then in the 19th century, you see, that becomes the focus. And certainly, if, when any, if anyone thinks of the Declaration today, it is that a promise of equality. That's what Frederick Douglass hammers and what Martin Luther King will bring back in 1963. And Lincoln, you know, Gary Wills Lincoln, wrote a whole yes. book giving yes. Lincoln the credit. And I right. do think Lincoln played a uh, played a huge role. Actually, there was an episode of Saturday Night Live, a skit on Saturday Night Live as recently as this last uh, Saturday, which was uh, uh, um, October twenty third of two, 21, 2021. It's it's a it's a it's a parody of the Nick Cage uh, movie oh, right. National Treasure. National Treasure. What's yeah. the phrase that Jefferson's writing as he as this 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 funny yeah, skit yeah. starts to happen? All men are created equal. If it hadn't been for Lemuel Haynes and other abolitionists. Yeah women's rights advocates, and then finally Lincoln, mm -hmm. they might be talking about some other phrase, or they might not be talking about it right. at all, right. because it failed at its original purpose. Yeah, yeah. We're talking with Woody Halton, the McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, author of the new book, Liberty is Sweet. Um, you know, one thing that uh, Jonathan Lane, our um, guy in charge, has found, the town minute books, all the towns in Massachusetts, they debated independence, should we go along with this or not? This is in April of 1776. Yeah, but then right. they write the full Declaration of Independence out in the town record books. You know, that is, they saw this as an important a transformational moment, whether it is just we're now seceding from the British Empire or it is the other piece of it. I mean, this is, um, if nothing else, this should get us to think seriously about what the document does and uh, what, what it's intended to do. So it's, since you mentioned it, I can't resist telling you, I was just in your hometown of Boston, the current hometown of Boston, uh, last week with my 12-year-old son. And it was fun to take him, A, to the site of the Boston Massacre. Mm -hmm. But as you know, that's also basically the site where Abigail Adams and others stood. Right. And I want to say July 15th. but you so I think it was the 16th or 18th. I'm not, I, as an historian, I have to confess I'm not good with dates, but it was. <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think you're right. I think it was July 18th. That, but they stood there to yeah. hear the Declaration of Independence yeah. read from the balcony, and she talks about all the privateers, that is, right, the yeah. ships uh, that, that that set off their cannon, and you can yeah. really, um, I don't know how much, you could tell me how much of the old state house uh, is restored. I know it's got a subway uh, station in its basement, so that wasn't yeah. there in 1770, no. but I don't know, you know, I some presume the balcony, what I'm looking at is new, but it is. Pretty cool. Well, there was a balcony there, and that probably is the balcony. It might have been redone. But, yeah, there was a stairway underneath it, too. But that would have been where she stood. And that's the balcony the governor would come out to read proclamations. And the the um, state archives, actually, they have the bill from the guy who opened it up that day so they could go in and read it. You know, so, <laughs> it was like, I love that. Yeah. Well, and as you know, it was a dicey time in Boston oh, yeah. because they'd had a big smallpox Epidemic, yeah. and it turned the whole town into a smallpox hospital for mm -hmm. that for a couple of yeah. weeks that is if you weren't under if you hadn't already had the 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 vaccine i mean hadn't already had the the virus and you were vulnerable mm -hmm. to it it was up to you to get the hell out of town right. yeah um, or lock yourself up because people like abigail were allowed to roam freely while they were under inoculation right and i do love the fact that you know 
being inoculated gives you smallpox. It makes you sick. Yeah. And yet she and all this other people, a uh, group of people, they wanted to be there. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, you also wrote a biography of Abigail Adams. And yeah, you, know, you really one thing I learned from it is that Abigail Adams was a pretty shrewd at investing in securities uh, and then used her largesse actually as kind of a for charitable charitable purposes to help support folks in the neighborhood. Um, so what drew you to Abigail Adams, other than that she's a fascinating character? What drew me was that I was doing a book on the economic origins of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And as with the origins of the revolution, the progressive historians, especially Charles Beard in 1913, yeah. had done a pretty crude yeah. economic right. analysis and said, oh, these guys that wrote the Constitution, they all owned war bonds. Right. And they were trying to, like Daddy Warbox, they were yeah, almost yeah. a contemporary of his, trying to make money off of off of it. And uh, I was persuaded there was a more complex relationship, mm -hmm. that there were a bunch of bond speculators, but th what they were doing was pressuring the states to uh, triple, and this is what happened, many states, m majority of states, tripled taxes in the 1780s to pay off the war bonds. Right. Uh, and that provoked Shays Rebellion, one of the provocations mm -hmm. of Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts. Um, and then Shays Rebellion in turn helped bring about the Constitution. Anyway, it's a complex relationship yeah. about the, it's kind of a boring book, to be honest. My publisher will be thrilled that I said that. This is your, your Unruly Americans, not the That's Abigail right. Adams. Not the Abigail book and not That's this a great book. Because I was getting to the, I was getting to the, to, to the, how I got to Abigail. Because while I was doing this, Thing. I don't find it boring, but other people do because writing about bondholders. And so I decided I needed to find one of these guys yeah. who I could use as to put a paint a face on all the rest. Right. And none of them was very well documented until I finally found one guy who really was well documented. And that guy was a gal. It was Abigail Adams, yeah. wow. who was so clever oh, yeah. with, with working those bonds. And you're right. She um, she gave a lot of that money out as charity, for instance, and mm -hmm. you may not use the word charity here because she owed it big time to Phoebe Abdi, mm -hmm. who had been one of the slaves who helped raise her, uh, but was freed, of course, by that same clause of the, mm -hmm. of the Massachusetts Constitution that you mentioned that abolished slavery in Massachusetts right. in 1783. It abolished discrimination in marriage in Massachusetts um, mm -hmm. more than 200 years later, um, making Massachusetts the first state to do that. But she, uh, her, Phoebe Abdi was free, but by that time very old and, you know, a load of firewood would show up on her doorstep and mm -hmm. that was Abigail. But she also, Abigail, kept a lot of this money and bequeathed it in her will. And when I was first reading her will, I was kind of happy to be there because she wrote in 1816, two years before she died. And and I was researching the book. Both of my both of those two books, which wasn't mm -hmm. the case of my earlier ones, this one and, and the Abigail book, are chronological. So anyway, right. I researched it chronologically too. I get to 1816. Good, I'm almost done. But then something was bothering me about this will that she wrote. And the thing that was bothering me is that John Adams was still alive. Wow. A married woman's not supposed to write a will. Right. Bob, she did it anyway. Wow. She had tried to get men like her husband to remember the ladies. Yeah. They had chosen not to do so. Mm -hmm. And so she just decided to act as though they had. And mm. she wrote a will. Now, she did put in there by and with the consent of my husband and to his great credit, he complied with it to the letter yeah. and that made it a legal document. But can I tell you one more thing about the will sure. by that time she had nephews in financial trouble, grandsons, so forth and so on. And she left them all nothing. Uh -huh. She left it all to her nieces, her granddaughters, her female servants, wow. her daughters. She left it all to women. Wow. That's amazing. You know, we're talking to Woody Halton, whose new book is Liberty is Sweet. And he's also written a biography called Abigail Adams that received the Bancroft Prize and is another really, uh, again, your work does tell a familiar story, but gets us to think about it in a different way. That is to refocus how we think about the revolution or a character like Abigail Adams or even the idea of bond, you know, the bondholders. And I think one problem may be that we historians generally aren't really good with finance or understanding how a financial system works. So I wonder how you got you interested or able to explain this to those of us who otherwise wouldn't understand. Yeah, I'm not sure I did get good at it at, at, in uh, Unruly Americans. I mean, graduate students read it, but but uh, it's, it is tough stuff. And uh, 
And I remember the first big financial chart, big chart I did of bond. I was doing a bond price series and I was calculating because you had all these bonds that were trading at like a fifth of their face mm-hmm. value, in some cases a 20th of their face value. And so to figure out how much, uh, how hard, for instance, the bonds, the, 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 the taxes that provoked Shay's Rebellion, most of them didn't have to be paid in real gold and silver coin. You could pay with bonds. And but they're still a burden, but you got to figure right. out how much of a burden. Anyway, I remember doing my first um, uh, spreadsheet to calculate the value of one of these taxes in Microsoft Word because that's wow. what I knew. And yeah. I later, of course, I had to learn spread. I had to learn Excel, Excel and yeah. uh, to, to actually do it in, in a reliable way. Um, but then uh, I remember one of the I had, I had an article uh, about um, uh, uh, about well, I did one of, about Abigail's bond speculation in our sort of house journal women there quarterly but an earlier one on that um the editor chris grasso a really brilliant guy Mm -hmm. uh, his great insight was put all this stuff on the internet you know we'll take your article but we don't want all that junk right yeah yeah (laughs) good uh actually you know we live in kind of a contentious time politically and also the history profession is a little bit fraught and one of the really interesting things about your new book liberty is sweet it has blurbs from both Hannah Nicole Jones and Gordon Wood, who seem like they're on different parts of the historiographic spectrum. And I think that's a real te- real achievement to have a room for agreement among historians who might not otherwise agree that we see things in the book that are worth, uh, worth reading. Uh, I think it's a testament to how kind those two friends of mine are. Neither of them is a close friend, but they are both friends. And, uh, and I was thrilled to have them and I would love it if my book starting with having those two because they are clearly uh, on the opposite sides of the spectrum th- that the fact that they were both willing to be um, to be on there uh, as blurbers um, that 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 I think it could be a unifying book I mean I certainly mm-hmm. wrote it as a narrative as a unified narrative um, because it's saying to people who are interested in the traditional story that's great, but if you really want to understand it and you put it better, I should have had you blurb it because it's the, oh, it's the same old stuff. But my name but, doesn't sell books. <laughs> um, uh, but my my point is 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 uh, even if you only care about the traditional story, mm-hmm. you need to know what African Americans and women and Native right. Americans were doing to, in order to understand that story. And likewise, somebody who may be obsessed with Native American history and not that interested in the mm-hmm. boring bat oh this Battle of Bunker Hill, do we have to mm-hmm. read about that? Well, it's uh, the the whole idea of that the the people that are defending a fort have a huge advantage over the people attacking that fort, right? That's sort of the story of Bunker Hill. That that illuminates Native American history, too. Native Americans were generally smart enough to never attack a fort. Right. Because they knew they were going to lose lots of lives and they valued lives, life in a way that the British officers and American officers Mm -hmm. even didn't. Yeah. So if we can talk a little then about the war itself and how the war changes on the frontier, that is, what's it like in, um, you know, Fort Stanwix or the uh, Ohio River Valley as the war is progressing? I'm going to see how quickly I can find it and maybe not quick enough because I have a map that I'm really proud okay. of in the book of a uh, an expedition in 1780, a multi-pronged attack where Native Americans set out from Detroit and here it is. Uh, I don't know how this is going to look on on camera, but I'll get it as close as I can. It's a mm-hmm. four okay. attack uh, wow. where they hit St. Louis, a native of a town near St. Louis or across the river uh, mm-hmm. called Cahokia. They hit Kentucky. They'd planned to hit um, the British in uh, New Orleans. I mean, the, the Spanish in New Orleans because mm-hmm. the Spanish were allies of the United States by by that time. And so that's one of those overlooked yeah. things because people had written about the Kentucky attack or the Pennsylvania yeah. attack or this or that. But, but if you, if you're looking from 30,000 feet, you see there's this coordinated effort and that was a mixed success uh, that they, they captured some of those places and captured a lot of people, but the, at least to the bigger point, which was one of the real centers of the American revolution that is, I think justifies my title hidden history because this is hidden is Detroit. Mm-hmm. Detroit. Because that's the main British headquarters in the West from which they are arming Native Americans and also coordinating their efforts. A lot of Native nations had been enemies of each other. And so my nation doesn't want to submit to your leadership. You don't want to submit to mine. But we can agree on this third guy. 
uh, the British to be a right. leader. That's how Martin Luther King, by the way, became the leader of the Montgomery bus guy. Right. Oh, yeah. No, the only no, guy no, no one hated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so so the, the British are really playing a crucial role. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Thomas Jefferson, quote unquote, coined the term empire liberty, he actually stole it from a woman named Esther de Burt Reed we could talk about. But when he coined the term empire of liberty, he was in a December 1780 letter to George Rogers Clark saying, you got to go capture Detroit mm. because that's the only way we can win the war in the West. There were about 12 American plans to capture Detroit, none of which succeeded. Detroit stood mm. uh, until, um, right. until the 1790s um, um, and and really was instrumental in the War of 1812. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so and so it leads me to agree with the Native historians of Native America who say indigenous people won the war in the West. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. We've been talking with Woody Holton, the McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, author of Liberty is Sweet. Is there anything else we should, this half hour has flown by. Is there anything else we should talk about? Uh, oh, I will advertise my uh, my uh, Twitter yes. account. It's Woody Holton USC. And I'm in the midst of putting up 76 quotes showing the African-American role in the origins of the revolution. Great. Woody Holton, USC. And it's been actually Jonathan's put it up on the screen. So, um, well, it's been great talking with you, Woody. And I want to thank uh, you for joining us. I want to thank Jonathan Lane, who is our um, producer and all of our listeners. You know, when we began this, we envisioned that it would be a small group of folks interested in history in and around Boston. And we do have those folks. We have listeners in Mattapan and Medford, but also in Moyoc, North Carolina, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, as well right. as Helsinki, Tel Aviv, and Edinburgh. So uh, <laughs> thanks to everyone for joining us wherever you are. And thanks to Woody, Woody Holton. And, Thank you so uh, much, Bob. Look, take care. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank <laughs> you.